Hello and welcome to the Newburyport Literary Festival online. I see everyone's starting to join us. We really appreciate you being here. My name is Leslie Hendrickson. I'm on the steering committee of the festival. Just a couple things before we start. We are using the webinar format, so you're not going to see yourselves. You're all on mute. I'm talking to the participants here. Um, and the way you can communicate with us is to use the chat or the Q&A. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and there will be time at the end to uh, address some of your questions. The um, talk is going to last about 25 to 30 minutes total. And um, we will, in the chat, you will find inf more information about our authors and our other events today and on May 3rd. There are also links there to our independent bookstore partners, the Bookshop of Beverly Farms and Jabberwocky, which is in Newburyport. They have all the books from our authors in the festival and we encourage you to support them or your local bookstore. And without further ado, I am gonna turn it over to Kent Garrett and Jean Ellsworth, who are gonna talk about their book, The Last Negroes of Harvard. Thank you again for being here. Thanks for having Hi, us. Thanks for having us. And uh, here is a copy of the book for you to take a look at. And uh, basically, uh, back in 1959, uh, Harvard admitted uh, 18 Negro boys, as we were called, and Negroes. And uh, at that time, we were the largest number of Blacks ever admitted to Harvard. Uh, we were, the only thing we really had in common was that we were all uh, Negroes and we were from the North and the South and all different parts of the country and uh, different economic, socioeconomic uh, uh, levels, uh, rich, poor. Uh, we were 18 out of uh, 1,100 uh, guys in the class. We were, so the percentage is about 1.595%. Uh, before that, they had let Negroes had gone to Harvard. We weren't the first, but we were the largest ever admitted at that time. And uh, we had numbers, and we were able to uh, develop a, uh, in addition to an individual racial identity, a group identity, and we were able to uh, bond together. And we ended up uh, being an entity at Harvard, and we formed the, and fought for and formed the first uh, black student organization. And uh, the book is about uh, what happened to us during those uh, four years. And, uh, you know, Harvard changed us and we changed Harvard. And at that time, I, I was not the typical, uh, you know, Harvard graduate. My folks had uh, grown up uh, in the South, grew up in the South, in South Carolina, and they came they were part of the migration to, from the South, and they came to this, uh, New York in about 1940. I uh, grew up in the projects uh, in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, my dad was a subway motorman, and they always had, uh, he always had two or three jobs. And I was, uh, did pretty well, did very well in school, went to Boys High School in Brooklyn, then went on to Harvard. And then after Harvard, I went to medical school for a year and uh, didn't really like that. Got into advertising. And uh, that's where I learned video and film, uh, actually mostly film at that time. And I went on to, uh, to, uh, to a Black Journal, which was the first uh, Black network news broadcast. That was about 1968. And there I really got into journalism and from there went to CBS for 10 years, NBC for 10 years uh, with Bro Tom Brokaw and CBS Evening News with uh, Dan Rather. And after that, I uh, got tired of uh, the news back in about 1997 and became a dairy farmer in upstate New York and milk cows for 10 years. And I got out, after getting out of that, I was left with what to do and uh, what's next. And I decided to uh, get in to do a video project about the 18 guys that had uh, happened, uh, that had been in my class, the 17 other guys. And uh, that's where Gene comes in. 
Well, yeah, Kent was interested in finding out what happened to these guys, um, and what, who had been successful, who, who was happy. You know. And when he described the project to me more than 10 years ago, I realized there was so much more to think about when, um, when we met these guys. Uh, I knew that they must, some of them must have gone to segregated schools and uh, was this was this an effort on Harvard's part to actually do something that we would now call affirmative action? So there was a lot of a lot of interesting possibilities there, and you know we just started finding the guys. You know Harvard people do tend to have good jobs and you know impressive resumes, so we started googling guys, and then we got in the car and went and interviewed them, and. Over the course of, I think it took us six or seven years to find that last guy, which was wonderful. Uh, four of the men had died before we started the project. But uh, in that case, you know, in the case of the deceased members of that class, we interviewed um, you know, spouses and children parents, you know, and friends. So we ended up with this enormous body of data, if you will, you know, these 18 fascinating life stories. And the next question was, okay, well, what are we going to do with it? And little by little, I think we realized that the things that mattered most were the experiences of the guys at Harvard. How did they come of age in this very unusual time? Um, you know, come of age not only as uh, individuals, as Kent said, but as a group at Harvard. And so we, you know, we just started working on you know, what really mattered. And one of the things that people kept asking is, well, what, what, what was their experience like? And I think one of the words that keeps coming up for us is they were curiosities. Right? Uh, yeah, I mean, there were people that, um, kids, guys that had never talked to a white Negro, guys. white guys that had never talked to a Negro before. And, uh, you know, the one of the question was, what is it like to be a Negro? And then secondly, what is it, uh, what do you people want? And after a while, that, that, that sort of questioning gets to be very uh, tiring and uh, trying. And so that was, uh, you know, a, 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 an issue. And out of, the, out of the curiosity thing, there were indeed, there were two papers written about us, uh, one by uh, one of our one of our classmates, and it was called uh, Bright Shadows in the Yard, and another one was called the uh, Rising Sons of Darkness. And so the the names of those papers uh, indicate, uh, you know, gives you a sense of what it was like back then in 1959. I mean, when you look at those papers now, I mean, you really one is incensed by the titles right off the bat, and uh, once you get into the details of the papers, uh, it's a very, a very different thing. I mean, and Jean can tell you about some of the content of the uh, Bright Shadows in the Yard paper, which was done by a guy named Ronnie, Ron Blau, who was one of our classmates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we, te we take some time in the book uh, really looking at these papers because they, first of all, they included a lot of quotations uh, from the guys at the time, you know, it's one thing for us to go and interview people 40, 50 years later and say, what were you thinking back then? But these papers gave us a window into that. But also, you know, it, it was a good window into what was the current sociological thinking about Blacks in, um, in 1959 and the early 60s. Uh, so that was, that was a really eye-opening experience. I think, though, that another important thread of it for us was, was it affirmative action? And the answer to that is basically, yes, Harvard was doing something that we would now call um, affirmative action, which was, a, a, you know, they were ahead of the curve. And I think that 
that, you know, Harvard does come out as a pretty good guy in many ways, right? Except then, you know, as your, as the guy's consciousness changed, that's a really important part of the story too. Yeah, I mean, I think like, for example, one of the questions in the uh, Bright Shadows uh, paper was, which you read now, it just you just get incensed by. But it was uh, if you were uh, born, if you were born, reborn. if you were reborn, would you want to be reborn as a black, as a Negro, or as a white? And uh, that was a question that, when you read it now, you just get angry about. But anyway, uh, the wonderful thing was that all eighteen of us uh, answered that we wanted to be. Uh, reborn as Negroes, that we liked who we were and our, our identity. And one of the classmates, uh, a guy named uh, uh, Hobie Armstrong, who lives not far from where we are here in New York, uh, answered the question. He was a football player, very, you know, principled, very down-to-earth, straight-laced guy. He said that, well, you know, if, if the question is, uh, do I want to be reborn, reborn as a Negro? or a white, he said, I'd like to try being white for a while and just sort of see what happens. Try it for a year, which was kind of a very funny, in insightful uh, answer to that question. But the whole issue of uh, one of the issues about rape, about the book was that there was some of the a bunch of surprises. One had to do with race in the sense that we were, we had uh, determined who would be in the book and who was black based on some black and white photos in the freshman yearbook uh, at Harvard. And uh, it turned out that uh, we had come up with the number 17 as opposed to 18. And again, uh, we had uh, submitted, once we got going on the project, uh, someone got in touch with us and said, hey, you're missing maybe two, uh, you know, two guys or so, or two people. And uh, naturally, I went into a big panic, which we had based this whole project on 17 guys. And he uh, said, no, no, you're missing uh, two. And he gave us the names and I called one guy and, uh, you know, which being an intrepid reporter, I mean, this is, and this is a very difficult conversation. I called and made some small talk and we talked a bit. And I told him who I was. And then uh, at the end of the conversation, I popped the question, uh, by the way, are you black or white? And he certainly laughed and he said, no, I'm, uh, I'm white. And that was the end of that conversation. And when I think about it now, I'm happy that he didn't say, uh, A, I don't think so, or B, I'll get back to you later. But anyway, he, uh, you know, he, 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 I passed them up and went to the next guy who turned out to be Jerry Secundi, who was indeed, uh, uh, black, but you couldn't tell from the photo. And even if you look at a picture of him today, you probably could not tell. But it turns out that his dad, his mom was from the uh, islands, the Caribbean, and his dad was Jewish. And uh, so these are all the guys you meet in the book. Um, and through the course of the chapters, which are arranged chronologically from their first day on campus to their graduation and beyond. Um, I think you, we, we tried to look at how their racial consciousness changed and a couple of things that were happening in the larger world had a big influence on that. Um, but they also uh, started the first African-American student organization, which was just, I don't think something that Harvard saw coming. Right. I mean, I think before, and before we get got to that, I mean, we had, uh, you know, set up, uh, turned out that we set up during our freshman year, the fresh, first black table at Harvard. And I had not, I had not been around whites growing up and many uh, guys from the South had not been interacted with whites at all. And, uh, the black table became a sort of a refuge for us uh, we, where we could go and talk about our own culture and talk about uh, uh, you know things that were happening in the black world back at home and uh, there's a, uh, a present day comedian named Dion Cole who has a little riff in his act about uh, 
how blacks have to manage their blackness. So for us back then, I mean, the uh, Harvard, uh, the black table was a place where we didn't have to manage our Negroness and we could just relax and, and et cetera, et cetera. And so that was uh, pretty significant and important to us back then. But in terms of the student organization, we, you know, back in the 60s, uh, kids were in the South were getting beat up and uh, uh, arrested as the civil rights movement was moving forward. And we decided that we had to really do something. And one of the things we decided to do was to set up a black organization that would be uh, open only to members uh, in good standing at Harvard who were uh, Afro-American or African. So we combined, we got together with some of the Africans in our class and set up this organization. And uh, lo and behold, the uh, college, the college faculty and uh, administration objected to it, saying that it was uh, reverse discrimination, that you can't have an organization that, uh, that has in its charter, it's only open to members of the uh, Black uh, or African and Afro-American community which took us by surprise and really uh, led to a big fight uh, with, with them over whether uh, we could do it. I mean, in the sense that Harvard had a tradition of having these dining clubs or social clubs called final clubs, which uh, admitted only the elite, but they didn't uh, put it in their charter. I mean, in these clubs, it could be no Jews or no new money, no, uh, no black, certainly, and no women. And uh, Harvard said to us, well, you know, we'll, we'll approve you if you take that out of your charter, and which for us represented a significant bit of hypocrisy. And, uh, and yeah, Harvard it, said, well, you can still only admit exactly who you want. In other words, African and African Americans, just don't say it. Right, right. So we ended up uh, fighting with them and ultimately, uh, you know, after we had graduated, uh, it was approved and uh, it still exists today. So, I mean, that is one of our legacies from the, uh, you know, from our years at Harvard. So, is there anything else? Are, are there questions? Yeah, there absolutely are some questions. Right. That was a great introduction. Thank you so much. Um, one of our participants would like to know if the university supported the 18 Negro students who came in. Well, not, not really. I mean, Harvard at that time, and I think it still is today, was not a supportive university, university as such. Part of the uh, it was like really sink or swim. I mean, the only thing about Harvard is that they did have a tradition of if you didn't do very well, they would let you take a year off and, and pretty much, you know, uh, let you come back in. And during my cl uh, years, I had to take uh, uh, one year of uh, one summer of summer school to, to catch up. So it wasn't supportive in that uh, sense. It might be now, but it's, it wasn't then. Right. There was. Um uh, support in terms of um, financial aid, yes. I mean, most of the, I would say most of the guys were on some kind of scholarships, right. but not all from Harvard itself. Um, but as far as any sort of thinking on Harvard's part that these 18 guys might need some, some sort of support as they faced being one percent of their class no sense of that at all gotcha um how did the kennedy assassination affect you or your friends or your education we were gone by then yeah we were kind of uh yeah we were gone by then I mean, we had uh, as a matter of fact i was in uh, medical school at that time at nyu so we were, we had gone. I mean, we were there, obviously, when he was, uh, you know, when he was elected. The election. The election was enormous on campus, and yeah. being an alumnus, and it was yeah, yeah, crazy. But um, now they had graduated by then. So. Gotcha. What was the most significant thing you learned while researching the book? Ooh. Go ahead. Boy. Well, 
I think that when I first heard about the project and looking up these guys, I pictured in my maybe naivete that they were going to be all much like Kent, you know, who grew up in poverty or in low income families or like geniuses plucked out of, you know, and sent to Fair Harvard. And first of all, no, some of, I mean, the, the, the 18 came from vastly different backgrounds, some from the black intelligentsia, the black elite. And uh, it, it wasn't as, as simple a story or a monolithic a story. Yeah, I mean, Such it wasn't. Variations yeah, it wasn't rags. Around. Rags. It was not right. rags to riches. And uh, I mean, I think Harvard did a good job in terms of who they picked, and, and, and with a sense of who they thought could make it through. And in fact, I mean, some of the uh, guys from the South were sent to prep schools uh, during the summer before or the year before to get ready for this movement to this other different world, different white world. And uh, so they were smart about doing that. And I think, I think in general, um, I learned that you don't think, there, there's not a black person. There's not, you know, it's not a monolithic experience to be black. There, there was such variety in their life stories. And yet there is this central um, consciousness that, that really showed through in the, in your full experience, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Hmm. Gotcha. Um, and <clears throat> so one of our participants asks what you think things are like for students of color at Harvard today. Um, you know, there have been some protests in particular about how they're viewed and treated at Harvard and other elite colleges. So what would you say about the students of today? Well, I mean, I've talked to a few, and when, we, and when I went back, I mean, it was a totally, uh, totally uh, different uh, situation. First off, I mean, the number of blacks in some of these classes were like in the hundreds, so uh, everybody doesn't know everybody. None of the blacks know everybody. And essentially now at Harvard, I mean, the, the, the problem has to do with the Asian community and uh, the fact that... Uh, you know, they're, they're grappling with uh, what percentage of, uh, of uh, people in the class should be or should become or are, a are Asians, and, and that's an issue. But, I mean, it's totally different now. I mean, those final clubs I mentioned earlier uh, now admit women, they admit Blacks. I mean, they even have a final club that's definitely uh, for Blacks. So, I mean, I think it's, it's changed. I mean, and we had gone, Gene and I went back to a class to talk to a class of, I think it was 1973, which was a class, uh, you know, 10, 10 years, years later. Yeah. And those guys were saying that you could get through Harvard now and even then by just dealing with blacks only. I mean, you, it was almost like you could be going to a, uh, you know, a black college. Uh, you didn't have to deal with, you could just stay in a black, stay with blacks in your dorm and black table, black faculty, et cetera, et cetera. So it's totally different. Right. And when you were there, was there a lot of interracial dialogue? Or, I mean, you mentioned how people would ask you, what's it like to be a Negro? But where, right. did, how did it go deeper than that? I mean, I think it did. I mean, I had, uh, not so much for me. I mean, my best friend were, was a, another Black guy from Pittsburgh. He was in the book a lot, Jack Butler. But I mean, I think the... You know, I think you came away, and many of us did, thinking that we're in different worlds. And these are guys, people that I'm not going to really relate to the rest of my life in a way. So, I mean, it was a, a very different uh, time now. I mean, I think very, I didn't get into any deep relationships with whites. And I think some, some of the other, other guys, guys did. Maybe yeah. some other guys did. Yeah. yeah. Um, there were a lot of strong friendships interracially that, um, well, as we learned from the class of 73, was really not the case um, a few years later. Interesting. And what was the reaction from some of your, <clears throat> excuse me, classmates that were featured in the book? Well, they all, I mean, they all were very 
happy about it. I mean, they were all very positive. I mean, there was one guy in the class who didn't, who felt that he didn't really want to talk about the past. Not so much that he didn't have a good experience at Harvard, but he just wasn't into looking back. And he's in the book, but not featured very much. But I mean, you know, there were a lot of surprises in the book. We found that uh, one of the classmates was uh, turned out to be uh, uh, gay. And uh, he talks a bit about spending four years, you know, in the closet at Harvard, not, not coming out. And uh, another guy was, uh, Anyway, another guy told us that he was uh, working for the CIA during the time at Harvard, and you know we we never really we never established really that established that. Me, but... That's what he told us, and uh, you know we agreed not to mention his name and that sort of thing. So there were some surprises. But I would say, by and large, the men were eager to talk about their lives and their experiences, and very willing to open up to us. And and they would show us family pictures and yeah. I mean, and essentially the book, yeah, the book sort of lets you know how we, we kind of fit into the civil rights movement at that time. Mm -hmm. And we did have a role, we did play a role. And in many ways, we feel that we sort of did our part in the sense that getting us, letting us into Harvard, so many into Harvard, was a kind of an experiment. And, you know, we did our part. I mean, we didn't, uh, you know, we, to use a football analogy, we, you know, carry the ball and we didn't fumble. And, uh... Amazing. Um, there are also some questions about how to access the book. Is it available as an ebook or uh, an audio book at this time? Yeah, yeah. It's a, oh. yeah, both, yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Great, and is there anything else that you all would like to add? We really appreciate you joining us here today at the first online festival for the new oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, it was so great. I'm so glad you did it because it, you know, it was, it's so disappointing to not be able to be there in person. But we're going to come up to Newburyport and check it out at some point. Yeah, and, and actually on um, the book website, you can not only read more about the book and find out where to get it, but also um, we have video clips of the interviews, the first round of interviews we did. So you can hear the men talking in their own words, in their own homes. And uh, the um, website is thelastnegrosofharvard.com. Great. Well, thank you both again for joining us. And thank you to every, all of our participants who were able to come in today. We really appreciate you being here. I hope you have a great rest of your Saturday. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye. <laughs>